system introductory part of the systems is very similar to what you have in C++. So we are discussing mostly terminology. We are not really, this is not about questions that we are asking on the test or anything like that, but just understanding of the terminology and what we mean when we say cables or when we say memory less or we say other terms in systems, right? So you need to understand oral terminology and then you'll be using that terminology for explaining other things. Now, also, it's very important to understand convolution because this is the main thing of that course and uh, we will be using convolution a lot. We will convert it using the plus response later. We will be using that for all kinds of implementations of filters. We will be using that in multiple different places. So it's important to understand the meaning of the convolution and not only how you compute the convolution. So computation of the convolution is much less important because nobody actually does it by hand. But once you understand what it means, this is all you need to get from the system's perspective. Okay, so I would like to start with a short reminder on the main topics that we had in those lectures. And the first thing, you have some system, you have input response of the system, you have some X of T, which is input of the system. And system is some smart box which modifies the input and produces Y of T. Now, that Y of T for linear time invariant systems, LTI, could be computed as X of T convolution with A of T. This is what you learned about that system, that special type of systems which is called linear time invariant. Now, what is that H of T? Response. Response of what? This is response by the system, yes. To what? The input menu. What kind of input? <coughs> linear. Hmm? Linear. What is linear input? I don't know any signals which are called linear signals. The system will be linear, signal cannot be linear. I mean, you have line signal, but like RAM. That's not a linear signal. The system is linear. And time and wire. It's a approximation. Um, no, this is very precise. No approximation skills. <coughs> so this is basically the descriptor of the black box, right? So you have some system which is having some inputs, and you compute output as convolution with some given function h. But what is the function? Convolution is what? Let's say this is motor, okay, it's an engine or something like that. You turn it on some voltage, it starts to turn, right? So number of rotations is your output, and voltage is your input. Right. If the system is MTI system, now how, how should you know that H of T? What that would be in the theoretical way? General area of something. Um, swinging that side. No. Other ideas? How it is called? What is sponsor of the system? H of T. It's impulse response. What is impulse? Graph delta. It's delta. So what it means with regard to x, what x you need to put to get h? This is impulse response. It's a response to impulse. And then if you put in instead of x of t, you put in delta of t, you get your h of t. That's what you get. There's impulse response of the system. You put in delta as input, like hammer shock to the system, just pulse, and then you get output which is h of t, which is some sort of wave, whatever it is. Now, that wave is exactly that same. Now, this signal is obviously only theoretical, so you cannot practically produce delta, right? You cannot have infinite voltage at zero time, obviously. But theoretically, this is what it should be. 
This is all it is. Now, for discrete system, you have something very similar. You have here x of n, here you have h of n, and here you have y of n, which is computed by convolution of x of n with h of n. Now, what is f? What is that thing? It's still delta response, but what kind of delta? Summation of infinitesimal pulses. Discrete chronic delta. And then you get H of n. Okay. The same thing. In the same rule, the same convolution, but in discrete case. And this is continuous case, continuous time case. This is the only difference. So for both that system and that system, you have exactly the same equations, exactly the same rules, exactly the same definition of H. Just in discrete case and continuous case. This is the difference. Any questions so far? Okay, so now system properties. You have multiple different system properties. Let's start. It's very easy one. Memoryless. What is memoryless system? So, system is no memory, as it says. It does, what it means, no memory? It doesn't it uh, on the require past outputs. No past and no future. So, this is a system which is output for which output dependent only on present. That's it. Now, it could be a system like that. Something of that kind. Okay. So it could be any system where the output at present time dependent on output at present time. That's it. Now, how about that system? It's not memoryless. It's, it's still memoryless. It's still memoryless. Because for each single n, including n minus 1, n minus 5, n minus whatever, plus whatever, that time of the output depends on the same time of the input. Okay? If this would be some other number, not minus one, but plus one or minus two or minus whatever, this would be system with memory. Okay? That thing is memoryless. Yes. So, so you said if, if the y, if the y, um, if it was just y n equal to x n minus one, then that would have, then that would have memory. So this one is memoryless. Okay? But if you put here minus two, for example. That would be this memory because it uses past value of x. Okay. Okay, so it's like one sample before. Because here, let, let's put just some n. So y of, for example, minus 1 equals twice x minus 1 plus y. y of 0 equals twice x 0 plus y, and so on. So for each time, which is just some given sample, it dependent only on the same time, not, not other times, not values of x at other times. How about putting here u of n minus 2? Still memoryless. Is it still memoryless or not? Yes. Why? Because the, we know the step function uh, values, and it's just a shifted step function, so we don't need to. Its values are not going to change. Yes, the value of the function is not going to change as a function of n minus 2 or whatever. It's constant, it's just given number, right? So it's not affecting the x of time, okay? So it doesn't matter which time you put here. This one will not affect it. Any questions? Okay. Let's talk about linearity. Linear system. So linear system is very simple. You have some input x of t, 
sum out of y of t, it could be x of t or x of n, it doesn't matter, I will just use continuous time case for simplicity. If you put in, for example, x1 of t, you get y1 of t. And this is the response of that system, or that was the system, some system. If you put x2 of t, you get y2 of t. So it's some other function, obviously. It's the same function, other function. So for that x, you get that response. For that x, you get that response. Now, linearity means that the response to some weighted sum of those is weighted sum of those. That is what it means, linearity. Which means that if you have some constant alpha times x1 t plus constant beta x2 t, they will produce alpha y1 plus beta y2. Now, pay attention that those are the same constants. Alpha and beta are exactly the same as here. Which means, in other words, you have superposition rule. So, superposition rule means you have linear system. Now, how you check it? It's kind of complicated to check it directly if you put all of that stuff in you. Somehow I don't think so. Somehow that is <laughs> so, <laughs> you divide in that rule, you divide in that rule into two rules. One rule is rule of k. If you multiply an input by some constant, the output will be multiplied by the same constant, right? So you put in twice x, you'll have twice y here. You multiply by 5x, you should get 5y here. Otherwise, the system is not linear. Okay, so this is rule number one, which is just multiplication by constant. Second rule, if this one gets you y1, that one gets you y2, the output to their sum should be their sum. Okay, this is rule number two, which is superposition rule. When both of them are true, the system is linear. Okay, this is how you check it, actually, mathematically. And you've seen many different examples of the systems which are linear, like integral or derivative or many other functions. And uh, any questions on the rules? We will see some examples later. Okay, time invariant. Time invariant means that if you're shifting x by some given time, forward in the future or backward in the past, y will be shifted exactly by the same constant time. Okay? This is the overall idea. The time invariant system, it doesn't matter where you start. It always will behave the same way. No matter where you start. This is very important to understand because it's a little bit tricky. Think about the system where you will start the specific zero time. Because what is zero time for us? In our case, zero time is not really well defined because we don't know where to put exactly zero point. Zero point is basically meaningless for us. It's just when you, we start our system of coordinates. Now, you can start it anywhere you want. But if system is not time invariant, invariant you cannot start it whenever you want. Because it will behave differently if you start in a different point, a different time. This is why we like those systems. We can start them at any time and they will behave exactly the same way as we started them like 10 minutes ago or 10, 10 minutes in the future. The reaction will be exactly the same. Okay? If you're shifting input signal by something, the output is shifted by the same thing. And the output is not changing. Okay? It's exactly the same output, just shifted. Any questions? So, the rule is that x of t minus t0 or tau, whatever you call it, will produce output which is shifted output by the same t0. This is how you check those things. Any questions? Okay. Causal system. 
this will be very important for stability of the systems and uh, the only systems we can actually realize in hardware are causal systems. You cannot realize in hardware anything which is not causal. So you cannot build any circuit or any system, physical system, which will be not causal. What is the reason of that? Because we don't know how to predict the future. So causality means the present state of the system depends only on the present state and past of the system, okay? Not future. So it cannot depend on the future inputs. So present y of t of m does not depend Future X of T. So you cannot have anything like X of T plus whatever. Now, this is also a little bit tricky. Let's see why. Let's say we have that kind of system. Is that system causal? No. Why not? So what? So this is tricky. Think a little bit more about that. How we can shift it? Is that time invariant? Invariant? What is the number of our one? T plus two, T plus three, T plus one. <coughs> Is it time invariant? No. It should be because generally speaking, you can identify it as time invariant only if you have time multiplied by something. Your time is outside of the brackets somewhere. Then it's time invariant. Mm -hmm. In most cases, it will be time invariant if T is inside of the break it somewhere in the function. Okay, it's argument of the function. Does that mean, so y is not dependent on y, so that's why it's still causal? In so the here, of the y, one of the y's dependent on another y, which is kind of differential on those times. Yeah. So it's dependent on y at different time, which is basically system which is changing in time. Okay? So, how about that system? So, so it is causal. Is it causal? Yeah. Yes. Why? So, any time invariant system you can write basically by shifting any of those times to any origin point, right? Uh -huh. So, you can say that this is the same thing as y of t equals y t plus 1, or even simpler than that. Plus three x t minus two. Right. This is the same system. I just start with at a different point of time. Now I can re reorganize that thing as that. How about now? So present y, which is t. Dependent on past y, which was obviously dependent on previous axis, and even farther away axis in the past. Is it causal? Yes. Yes, it is causal. So the system is also causal. So sometimes those questions are a little bit tricky because you need to reorganize the equation in some way to see what is y at point t. And things like that, for example, if y of t equals s of t plus 1 is obviously not possible. This is one step predicted. And you cannot build that kind of thing in hardware. But you don't know what will be the next steps in signals. 
Any questions? Okay. Now let's see a little bit more complicated examples. We have a system which is defined like that. Y of n equals 0 0.75, y n minus 1, minus 0, 0.125, y n minus 2, plus x of n. And the question is to check if system is time invariant, causal memory less, or all those properties. Okay, so what do you think about memoryless? Is it memoryless? You don't need any memory to compute y of m. Do you need any memory to store any numbers when you move into the next? Sample here. Yes. Yeah. Obviously, you need to store this one. And you need to store this one. Unless you can cancel them somehow, you have to store them to get to the next n, the like n plus one. When you're doing that iteration of one step, then n gets n plus one, right? So you need to store those y values. So you have two. Yeah. Okay. So this is. Not memoryless system. How about um, time invariance? Is it a time invariant system? Uh, yeah. Why? Because there's no n multiplier on the outside. So if you put n minus in zero, then it's going to yes, be the same system. Exactly. So you don't have any dependence on pure n or time, in that case, sample. So there is no n multiplied here or there or any other function of n anywhere outside, which means that this is time invariant system. How about linearity? This is tricky. It is linear. Why? Yeah, from that one, it's difficult to some see. Some of them are well, some you just need to know that all the differential equations, uh, linear differential equations, and linear difference equations are linear in the sense in the sense of the systems, but we are not proving it right now. So we will have z transform to prove it. So one of the last lectures in that course. So right now, it's kind of difficult to see just by looking at that, that this is really linear. You will have some better technique to identify that the system is linear. How about causality? Is that system causal? Yeah. Why not? It, it is causal. It has to be causal because present Y dependent only on past Values as values of s, so it has to be called. <coughs> okay, let's move on to convolutions. It's a lovely part. <coughs> Somehow, this is the most difficult part in most of the courses on signal processing how you compute convolution. But practically speaking, it's all technical if you know how to do it step by step. So, do you remember how to compute convolutions? What is the process? So you should learn it because this will be very useful for the test. <laughs> Not much more than that. So, practically speaking, convolution is taking one signal, inverting it in time, moving it to some specific point, and then shifting it from that point Convolving it with other signal. 
those two signals are H and S, which are impulse response and your input. So taking input or impulse response depends on which one is easier to invert, okay, to flip left, right. And then you're just moving them and integrating the intersection between them. Okay, this is what you do to convolve. This is how you do that. So you're basically taking one signal, flipping it, moving it, and then moving it from here to there. When it meets with the second signal, you're just integrating the common part. And then moving more, integrating, 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 and getting some output. So that this is convolution. Now, in discrete case, it has also different explanation of what is that. And you know convolution from middle school, I guess. When you started to learn about polynomials, you already learned something about convolution. They haven't named it convolution, but you obviously know how to multiply two polynomials. And multiplication of two polynomials is basically convolution. Uh, basically, convolution between the coefficients. So if you multiply two polynomials, the result is polynomial with other coefficients, and those coefficients are basically convolution between the coefficients of the basic polynomials that you start with. This is the idea. So let's see how it works in discrete case, because it's easier. Let's say you have a function x of m, given as u of m minus u of n minus 2, and then h of m, which is definition of the system itself, given as u of m minus u of n minus 4. Now, if you want to draw that thing, it will look like that. So we'll have one new look. One will start here. We'll go from here, now we'll jump up, continue, drop, and continue. Like that, this will be two. This will be zero. This will be x of n. This is m. Now second one will look like that. Yeah, it will go from minus infinity to zero. And then it will jump, go to four, jump down, and continue. This is H of n, this is n. Any questions about why is that so? So, obviously you cannot have that thing continuously, right? So basically you have 0, 0, and then it jumps to 1, 1, 1, and then again zeros. So you have those bars. And the same thing here. You jump here from zeros. This is discrete time case for those steps. Any questions about that? Okay, so the first step that we need to do is to convert M into I. This is step number one, always. So step number one, I'm removing the M. I'm saying this is I. Not even you. This part is secret. Part of convolution. Replacing the, the name. Now, the second thing that I need to do is to invert one of them. Which one is easier to invert? Here. <coughs> so, which one is easier to invert? I guess shortest one. I mean, both of them are kind of easy. But X is easier, it's shorter, smaller. Okay, so we inverting X. 
and we're getting x of minus one. How it should look like? This is lecture number one from that course. Just flipping left, right. right. So I get one point here and one point here, minus one. And then zeros. Correct. Why did you erase the point at two? Yeah. It should be two. Because look, what is the value here at two? One. What is the value here at two? It's two minus two, it's u of zero. So what is u of zero? Four. It's one, so it's one minus one. Okay. You just did it wrong the first. Yes, yeah, so I just followed the line, because that line it should be already zero. Any other questions? No, that we got four, which we should put a right table. So Technically speaking, four is here. Okay. So three, two, one. Okay. Okay. So this is flip one. But we are looking for something else. We are looking in convolution for x of n minus i. When n is given constant. Okay, n is just number. Some given number. It could be any, any number from minus infinity to plus infinity. Mm -hmm. You want to find it for any m, any given m. Okay. Now, how it will look like? So it will be somewhere here, or here or there. It doesn't matter. You draw it. It's easier to draw it farther to the left. But what will be that number? No, it's not zero. Zero is here. This is zero. So it was when it was minus i, this was zero. But now it's n minus i, which means you just added n. Like shift by n. So, this so what it will be? Yeah. The n. Whatever the n is. Then it's some given number. It's still here, it's still one. Now, what will be the second one to the left? And minus one. Okay, so this is just general x n minus i. And this is a process that I recommend doing when you're doing convolution every time. Just to plot it one by one. And that will be much easier for you to see all of the geometry of the problem, if you like. Now, this one, I need to convolve now with this one. Because basically convolution is z one multiplied by z one and sigma on all of them. Right? So convolution is basically sigma on x n minus i h i. This is convolution that we are looking for on all i. Now obviously when this thing is here, to the left, they have nothing in common. So we need to start with those moving from minus infinity to plus infinity one by one. So what will happen if n smaller than zero? What happens if n is smaller than zero, which means that this one is not touching anything here, so it's not getting to here at all. The energy will be zero. It's or not in at all, sigma. So so summation will be 1 times 0 plus 1 times 0, which is just 0, right? So it will be the convolution will be 0, OK? Now, when n equals 0, what do we have? So we have this one sitting exactly here, and this one is sitting at minus 1, right? And then you multiply it by those. So you get 0 times this one plus 1 times 1, right? Again, 0 times 1 plus 1 times 1. That will be 1. If I want n equals 1, so we'll move 1 by 1. Which means that n is here. So 1 is here, 1 is here. 
Вот от глобализации. One times one plus one times one. It's two. Okay, moving to those two. What will be m equals two? Be one times one plus one times one again. Again, same thing. M equals three. Here. Again. M equals four. One. N equals five. Equal larger than five. Zero. It's here. Zero. Zero. So for any number larger than five, it will be zero. Let's plot it. They look like that. This is the convolutional. X M convolution is H M. We look like that. So for anything which is smaller than zero, it's zero. Minus one, minus two, and this is m. Okay? Now for zero, it will be one. One. Then it goes two, 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 two. And then again, one. And then zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. This is how convolution is graphical. Any questions? Now I want you to guess. What will be the answer to that one? What will be the answer? Using what? Using thinking. <laughs> Without computing. You have everything already computed on the board. So what will be the answer? Now using the n equals zero and equals one to over the by by using that graph. Yes. Oh. Um. Obviously, she start with x. Or four, right? Then you have x three, x two, x one, and some constant. Something so is missing. Plus one. Plus one, yes. What else? There's um there are going to be coefficients or uh, yes. exponents. Three, so what are the coefficients? Two. Two, two, two. So here it's one. Yeah. There's here it's two. Two, two. Two, two. Two, 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 and one again. Mm. This is multiplication of polynomials. This is how you do it. Well, well, this way is easier, I guess, than this one, but the result will be exactly the same if you do it. <laughs> yeah, it's not tricky, you can try it with any other polynomials. By the way, multiplication of convolution, multiplication of of the polynomials and convolution and method is the same column. Using column to multiply two polynomials. You know that, right? You want to multiply two polynomials like that, you just write in column and then list of coefficients of the first one, comma, list of the coefficients of the second one. And then you get third polynomial, which is zero multiplication. It's simple as that. Okay, let's try the same thing for continuous case. Have some 
function which is square brackets function of t and some function h of t and they will be given same thing and you want to convolve which means you want to find output of the system to the input. Can you guess how it will look like? <laughs> Just based on that. It should look similar. This is the same input and the same T, but continuous case instead of discrete case. Can you name the shape? This is the shape. You can see. Square trapezoid. Looks like trapezoid. Have a smaller one going up, then flat, then going down. How do you try? But let's prove it. Okay, again, the same technique, exactly the same thing. First of all, we need to draw it. You draw it as a function of n. You can go directly with i if you want. It doesn't matter. And then you have the second one. As a function of n, this will be x of n, x of not n, t. And h of t. OK, so the first one will look like that. Second one, you will have that. Okay. Now you're replacing T T star or T zero or whatever you prefer it to be. Let's say tau, some other variable, auxiliary dummy variable integral. Okay, now you need to flip one of them. So you get from this one, you get this one. You get x of minus tau. x of minus tau is that same, just flip that way. You get something like that. Okay, next step. You need to move it. So this is coming from here, and then you're moving it. Because we want to get x of t minus tau. This one is tau. So t minus tau will look like that. And this one starts at t and goes to where? So what is the left side here? T minus, T minus 2. T minus 2. Okay. Now we are ready because we want convolution, which is integral from minus infinity to infinity of x T minus tau, h of tau, d tau. This is the convolution integral that we want to compute. So you want that same moving from minus infinity to plus infinity, crossing with that same, and on the joint area you want to integrate, which means you just multiply that one by that one in joint area, and then computing the total area in the, in the multiplication. Okay. So let's see. When t is smaller than zero, what is the convolution? Here. Zero. Why? Because they are not even crossing. Right? So this one is sitting somewhere here before the zero. Now, what are the next critical points that we have here? So zero is obviously a critical point. What is the next critical point where it will change some behavior in the integral 
because you just integrate in that common area. Now, next time it will be changing when it gets exactly to that point, right? Like when this thing getting here. Why? Because after that you'll have that kind of pools. And you'll be integrating only on that area, not from here to there, but only here. Right? You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the next critical point is where they completely overlap, but this is still not moving in. And then you don't need to remove that part. So next critical point will be point two. When t is exactly at two. And then it will start at zero and will end up at two. Now, from that point it will move forward until it gets to here, right? And nothing will change. Now, what is that point? So this point is four. So next critical point is four. Now you continue to moving out from that point. What is the next critical point? Six. Six. Okay, so those are points at which we need to change something. Okay, the integral will change basically. Okay, so let's see what happens. So for t between zero and two, what is the integral? This is integral from zero to t on the first one multiplied by the second one, which is what? And you can get the value. So it's not zero to two? No, it's from zero to t. This is a pulse, so the pulse goes like that. Goes so is it zero less than or equal to t, which is less than two? So this is t, and this is t minus two. You need to compute it for every t in that interval between zero and two, right? And this will be a function of t. So at that point, t is somewhere here. All you need to integrate is that area. To find that area. So what is that area? Again. You have that pulse, and you have that pulse. This is t, this is t minus 2. This one is 4, and 0. Okay? You want the multiplication as a function of t in that interval. When t is some constant in that given interval, right? So you want that as a function of that constant. And you will get obviously some number, which is also constant, but the function of t. So what is that number? Just t. This is exactly what this integral is. Yep. Like when it's really, really just touching the side, right? It's zero, right? And it's really here. Okay, but a little bit here. It's really zero. When it's getting here more and more and more and more, you get higher and higher area, right? Mm -hmm. Which is that area just growing, 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 growing linearly. And this is exactly T. Until you get to which number? Two. Number two, right? Because this is the area when you multiply them completely. So for T, between 2 and 4, you basically get integral from 0, no, from 0, from t minus 2 to t, right? Because this is already inside of that thing, right? So starting from t minus 2, ending at t, or 1 times 1, bit tau. What will be the area? Two. Two. Constant. 
doesn't matter which thing you choose. It's always flat. But it's still a function, function of time. It's two, but function of time. So it's constant line. Now, for t between four and six, what will happen is that that thing is crossing here. So it's starting at t minus two here and ending up at four, right? So it's integral from t minus two to four. So what that thing will be? T minus four. T minus four. Six minus t. Six minus t. So what this integral is. And it's obvious why because you're starting at two, right? And you need to go down because you're here, so you're starting exactly at two. And then this two linearly should go down. So when you're starting at four, like t equals to four, right? You get six minus four, which is exactly two. Right? So you are not jumping anywhere. It's all continuous. Okay, now t. 106, you get conversion of zero. Now we need to plot. So plot will be very simple. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is x of t, conversion is h of t. So you're obviously starting with zero when it's smaller than zero, so it goes like that. Nothing happens here. In that interval, very easy to draw it. So it's two. In the interval between two and four, and then you're linearly going up here. Linearly going down here, which is trapezoid. Any questions? to continue with that function. Some tricky questions about those functions. The question would be to determine step response of Z system for M equals one, two, three. By the way, this was one of the test examples, so it might be interesting for you to know in one of the previous tests. Now, you want step response of that system. How do you even start to think about that thing? First of all, you need to identify what is y of n minus 1 and n minus 2. Because to compute the next value, you obviously need to know those previous values. Otherwise, how can you compute it? This is some sort of difference equation. Now, you need to know that in that course, and probably in most other courses, if initial conditions, which are conditions on those y, previous y's, are not given, you are assuming initial condition zero, unless otherwise stated. Which means that you're automatically assuming that for all n before zero, for example, all of them equal to zero. So those two values, zero and zero. Again, unless otherwise stated explicitly in the question. 
So the question just says find the step response. It's uh, you're assuming this is zero. I can give you some numbers like y of minus two will be equal to something, and y of minus one will be equal to something. But if I'm not giving those values, those are zero. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Now, how do you compute step response of that function? Now, step obviously is in that case looks like that. So it's zero, zero, zero. Here. Zero, and then jump to one. At zero, one, two, minus one, minus two, and so on. Okay, this is how a discrete step, step function looks like. Now, this is u of n, is a function of n. Now, all I need to find is the response of z system to z input. And my input is x, so I'm just replacing z1 is u of n. And I want to find it for different values of m. I obviously have to go step by step. I cannot find all the values right away before we learn about z-transform, because with z-transform we actually can. But without z-transform, we have to go step by step. And what I need to do is just to write that explicitly. What I want to know is y0 equals 0, 0.75, y minus 1, minus 0, 0.125, y of minus 2, plus u of 0. So this will be 0, this will be 0. And I left with what? One. With one. Okay. Now, y one is zero seventy five. Y zero minus zero one twenty five. Y minus one plus u one. So this one is zero. Let me define them. We have y minus 1 equals y minus 2 equals 0. Initial conditions. This one equals 1. So what is that? Also 1 from here. We just compute it in the previous step. And now I need to compute it. So it equals to 0 0.75 plus 1 which is 175. And generally speaking, if you get any numbers in the test that you have calculated to compute it, most probably you're doing something wrong, because in most questions, we, I'm trying at least to give some numbers which are computable without calculator. Even if those numbers look like that. But not always. This was not my test, by the way. The last one that they asked is number two. So 0 0.75 times y1 and 0 0.125 y0 plus u of 2. So this one is 1. y0, we computed it to be 1. Y1, we computed it to be 1.75. And now you need calculator. Something of that kind. And that way you can continue for any end, obviously. 